The heart is now removed from this extension tubing and placed on the main stopcock located underneath the oxygenator. The perfusate dripping off at the apex of the heart collects in the heart chamber which is filled with perfusate. The heart must still be freed from adhering tissue such as remnants of the aorta, the pulmonary vessels and the connective and fatty tissue. Special care must be taken to protect the atria, especially because of the sinus node located in the right atrium. It is also important, where necessary, to enlarge the approach to the mitral valve and therefore to the left ventricle at the entrances of the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. It is through this aperture that the balloon catheter for measuring the ventricular pressure has to be introduced into the left ventricle. The heart is already beating strongly and rhythmically. This balloon catheter consists of a bulbous cannula bent through 90 degree and a small latex balloon shown yellow here. The diagram indicates the point on the left atrium where the catheter has to be introduced. The atria are difficult to recognize on the preparation because they are not filled with perfusate and are therefore collapsed. The liquid-filled steel catheter is connected directly to a pressure transducer, which in turn is mounted through a joint on a vernier height drive. With this arrangement, the balloon can now be positioned precisely above the opening in the left atrium. This is a schematic diagram of the arrangement for measuring the left ventricular pressure. It consists of the cannula with balloon, an isotec pressure transducer, a three-way stopcock and the spindle syringe. In order to pressurize the balloon, the three-way stopcock is set to provide a connection from the spindle syringe to the transducer dome and from there through the cannula to the balloon. The short piece of tubing which extends downwards is necessary for accurate zeroing of the pressure measuring system. The catheter is now introduced from above through the opening in the left atrium while at the same time carefully raising the heart and is then passed through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. Next, we see how the balloon is pressurized with liquid with the aid of the spindle syringe so that a pressure of 10 mm mercury is produced. The pressure setting has to be checked on the recorder or better still on an oscilloscope. 
Monitoring on an oscilloscope is preferable because the signal can be spread out, which is not possible on the recorder without inducing overshoot. A coaxial electrode is placed on the right atrium in order to stimulate the heart. In addition, two suction electrodes are placed to record an electrogram. This is a more detailed view of the technical equipment. The two suction electrodes are linked to the two inputs A and B of the ECG amplifier. The zero connection is made at the back of the main stopcock through the conducting perfusate. For a large R wave, the electrodes A and B should be placed on the base and on the apex of the heart, respectively. Mm -hmm. Here is the thermostated heart chamber, which is filled with perfusate. It is raised far enough so that the heart is fully immersed in the liquid. This ensures a constant temperature and humidity for the heart. This is the complete amplifier unit. Now the stimulator is set, unless this has already been done, to the stimulation frequency for the heart. 270 pulses per minute, corresponding to a basic rhythm of about 220 milliseconds. A stimulation width of 0.5 milliseconds is sufficient, and the amplitude should not appreciably exceed 4 volt. Finally, we take a look at the recording traces. Shown from the left to the right are the left ventricular pressure in millimeter mercury, the differentiated curve of the left ventricular pressure in millimeter mercury per second, the coronary flow in milliliter per minute, and the perfusion pressure, which is initially set to 50 millimeter mercury. A load test is necessary to check the correct operation of the heart. The test consists of increasing the perfusion pressure in steps of 10 millimeter mercury. This produces an extension of the myocardium as when increasing the filling pressure, with the result that the contractile force increases according to the frank starling mechanism. We can identify this here 
by the increase in ventricular pressure and the DP by the T. This procedure is known as the Gregg effect. Evaluating the left ventricular pressure curve, we obtain the corresponding Frank Starling function curve. The experimental sequence is controlled in this case by a laboratory computer using the ISOHART software from HSE. Here we can see a display of the traces alternating every five seconds with the digital values. Here finally is a general view of the entire equipment. The central element is the oxygenator with the transducers. On the right is the blue respiration pump which is running. On the left is a stack consisting of the Plaxis electronics unit at the bottom, the stimulator in the middle, and at the top, the narco flow meter for coronary flow. Next to it is the recorder, and then the PC. The complete setup can be adapted by suitable variations to meet individual requirements. This here is the apparatus for the isolated rabbit heart with a variant for perfusion using whole blood. We wish you every success in your experiments. experiments.